Psalm 118. We're going to do the whole thing this morning. I'm just going to start with the first four verses. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. For His loving kindness is everlasting. Oh, let Israel say His loving kindness is everlasting. Oh, let the house of Aaron say His loving kindness is everlasting. Oh, let those who fear the Lord say His loving kindness is everlasting. Father... We say this morning, your loving kindness, your grace, Lord, is everlasting. Your grace is eternal through the person of Jesus Christ. And Lord Jesus, we praise you. We know that we are in an eternal relationship with you. Father, it's my prayer, it's my ongoing prayer that anyone not in that eternal relationship would find you, would come to you, would would hear your voice beckoning them. Father, we just pray this in a world that is that is darkening, we pray this. In a world that is confused and lost and rebellious, we pray that people will come to know your loving kindness. And may we, in every aspect of our lives, Father, realize what it means to show that loving kindness. Give us grace like you have given grace to all of us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 118 is a big one. It's at the tail end of the great Hallel, six psalms. It comes at the last, and this one is huge. As so many of the passages of Scripture and the psalms we've looked at, as so many are prophetic, this is at the, uh, at the top of that. It is a milestone in our study through the Word. Milestones are important. Thursday, January the 6th of this last week, 2011, the House of Representatives laid down what I would call a milestone in our nation's history. For the first time in 235 years, the Constitution was read aloud. Perhaps you tracked that. And I was impressed by that, not only at the reading of the Constitution, but the fact that it's taken us 235 years to review it, to consider what was written back then that has such an impact on us now and whether or not it should, as I believe it should. We need milestones in our lives. We need those times where we stop and think about what's going on here. What is this about? What's happening here? These milestones help us to mark the journey that we're on together. And we are on a journey. We are headed to a final destination, every single one of us. Milestones are important. The Lord instructed Israel to erect milestones specifically several different times, but one that stands out to me is as they cross the Jordan, or right before they cross the Jordan River, to come into the Promised Land after 40 years of wandering. The Lord told the people in Joshua chapter 4 to take up 12 stones out of the riverbed. Remember, the river was dried up. It had stacked up in a heap a couple of miles or so upriver, around the corner where they couldn't even see it. The water had stopped. The priests are standing in the middle of what would be the Jordan River, but it's just the riverbed. And they're holding the Ark of the Covenant there, and the people then begin to travel through as the priests stand there. And the Lord says, Twelve stones, I want one for each tribe. Pick up a stone as you go through the river. And on the far side, when you enter the Promised Land, put them down. Milestones. Markers of a journey completed as the people came into the Promised Land. This morning is actually a milestone for our fellowship in more ways than one. It was seven years ago, the second Sunday of January, that we had our first worship service in this barn. Exactly seven years ago to this day, we met for the first time. I remember that first meeting, and it wasn't snowing, but it was cold. We didn't have this nice heater blowing, and we huddled around those little space heaters, and I think two or three people passed out. But it was a great time. (laughs) And that was our first service, so we're, we're at a milestone today, seven years of of meeting together and growing together and and journeying through the Word of God together. And you know, we set out on a simple journey. I think we've been keeping it pretty simple. I I, I believe the Lord has kept it simple for us to listen to the Holy Spirit and to follow God's roadmap, the Bible, the Scriptures. In fact, in those early days, we opened up Genesis. And we started in Genesis chapter 1, and we've been moving through the Bible ever since. And here we are today in an interesting place, because today, after seven years, with Psalm 118, we will cross the midpoint of Scripture. We're halfway there. Seven years, so you can figure we're about on the 14-year plan for studying the Word of God. Not bad. We cross the midpoint today. 
Psalm 118 sits in the very middle of Scripture. In fact, it's sandwiched in between the shortest chapter in the Bible, Psalm 117, and the longest chapter in the Bible, Psalm 119. We're going to look at Psalm 119 next week, perhaps over the next couple of weeks, we'll see. But there are 594 chapters before Psalm 118. There are 594 chapters after Psalm 118. Now, you math wizards, think this through in your heads. 594 plus 594 equals 1,188, or 1188. And the middle verse of Scripture is Psalm 118, verse 8. 1188. Which is just interesting to point out. Look at that verse real quickly, will you? It's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. That's the midpoint of Scripture. It's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. You want to be at the center of God's will? Go to the center of God's word. It's better to trust in the Lord or to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It's the question that we all will have to answer. We have to answer this in our lives. It doesn't matter who you are, what you've done, where you've been, or where you think you're going. We all have to answer the question, will I trust in man, that is, mankind or even myself, or will I take my refuge in the Lord? The prophet Micah issued a strong warning regarding trusting man versus trusting God. He said the following, Do not trust in a neighbor. Do not have confidence in a friend. From her who lies in your bosom, guard your lips. For son treats father contemptuously. Daughter rises up against her mother. Daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own household. But as for me, I will watch expectantly for the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Don't trust any of those around you. Malachi references neighbors. So I no longer trust Rod or Barb Gilmore. <laughs> says don't trust the wife. You know, she who lays there in your bosom, don't, don't share secrets with her. I'm not talking to Cheryl anymore. <laughs> the, the focus, the point, what Malachi is saying, what he's prophesying is, those who you would think would be most trusted, you can put your trust in them, but it's going to fail you at some point. So you put your trust in the Lord. You wait for the God of your salvation doesn't mean you don't care for or trust those around you, but it does mean that your focus is on the Lord. Your trust is with Him. Because He won't steer you wrong. I will. Friends will. Family will. The Lord will never. It's interesting because Jesus quotes Malachi in Matthew chapter 10, saying that conflict and strife would be the result of His coming. And that's confused people because they say, well, wait, I thought He was supposed to be the Prince of Peace. He is. But he recognized that conflict and strife would be the result of his coming. Not the reason. The reason of Jesus' coming is peace. But the result of his coming among us would be to stir it up. It would be strife. It would be contention and difficulty. And then after quoting Malachi, Jesus says this, Matthew 10, verse 36. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Now, now if Jesus was just another rabbi, he's just another man walking on the face of the earth, what right would he have to say such things? Uh, The Jewish leaders wondered that. What right do you have to call for that kind of obedience? An obedience that even surpasses family. He who loves family. Luke puts it this way. Luke heard Jesus say, or or the people that Luke interviewed heard Jesus say the following. If someone comes to me and does not hate mother, father, sister, brother, wife, he's not worthy of me. The only way Jesus could make a statement like that is if Jesus himself had taken up or was about to take up his cross, the very cross he's called us to take up. Jesus never asked us to do anything that he hasn't already done. He never asks us to go anywhere that he's not willing, wasn't willing to go himself. Don't forget, Psalm 118 is the last song Jesus sang before his crucifixion. And so this verse takes on a, a new poignancy. It's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. 
When Jesus invites us to take up our crosses and follow Him, when He says, I want you to trust wholeheartedly and completely in Me above all others, He has every right to. Because He first took up His cross. And He died on our behalf. We're told again in Matthew 26.30, after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. I always used to wonder what that hymn was. You know, Soldiers of Christ Arise. You know, was, was that the one? How Great Thou Art. What did they sing? And as we've talked about over the last couple of weeks, it's most likely that the song that was sung was Psalm 118. The psalm we're about to look at is the psalm following Passover before they head out to the Mount of Olives that Jesus and the apostles sang that night. The Greek word in Matthew 26.30 is humneo. And it means hymn. After singing a hymn, humneo, they went out to the Mount of Olives. But understand this. Humneo among Jesus' day was a word that was applied specifically to the singing of the Paschal hymns. The Passover hymns. What are the Passover hymns? The Great Hallel. Psalm 113 through 118. So when you said after singing a hymn, they're talking about those, the conclusion of that set of hymns at the Last Supper is Jesus led the apostles in the singing of all these six psalms and then concluding with Psalm 118, which is a psalm full of messianic milestones. Huge things having to do with Jesus. I was reminded again this morning of one of my favorite verses. And that's Psalm chapter 40, verse 7. Repeated in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 7. Behold, I come. In the scroll of the book, it is written of me. When you understand that, the Bible opens wide. When you understand this book is not a history book, but it is a Jesus book, suddenly things begin to fall into place like never before. Psalm 118, without the recognition of it being about and for and through Jesus Christ, doesn't make sense. But when you see Jesus in these milestones that we'll cover this morning, it's absolutely breathtaking. This book's about Jesus. This psalm is about Jesus. Verse 1 again, Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. For His loving kindness is everlasting. Loving kindness is that word again. Get this down. Hesed in the Hebrew. It means grace. His grace is everlasting. You know, our worship of God, gang, is not a mindless exercise of emotion. We spent some time talking about this Wednesday night. We don't worship God mindlessly. We don't come in and worship because that's what we do. You know, that's the way we do it at the bridge. And we don't worship because it feels good. And we don't worship because we're caught up in the emotion of it. In fact, you don't even have to be in the mood to worship God. Because it has nothing to do with our mood, our feelings, our sensibilities. It has to do with the truth that the loving kindness of God is everlasting. So give thanks to the Lord, for He's good. His loving kindness is everlasting. That word for could also be translated because. Give thanks to the Lord because. He's good. There is always a because behind our worship. And as we worship the Lord, I encourage you all, we've got to think about that. We need to enter into the because. Why am I worshiping today? What is behind this? It's okay to bring your mind, your mentality into worship. For your spirit to command your mind to think about what you're singing. And articulate that even to the Father in your heart in praise. Hezekiah wrote in Psalm 116, verse 1, I love the Lord because, because He hears me. 1 John 4, 19, we love the Lord because He first loved us. Not because we figured Him out. Not because we finally got it together. Because He first loved us. That's why I love Him. What is the because behind your worship? You see, until you dial into that, until we can grasp the because, we're going to have trouble worshiping. Until we understand the because behind our worship, we're going to have trouble taking our refuge in the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord because He is good. His grace is everlasting. Now, the next three verses, verses 2, 3, and 4, are actually written and sung responsively. So the Levite or the lead singer or the the worship leader would sing the first sentence and then the congregation would sing the second. So we're going to do it that way. Verses 2, 3, and 4, I'll say the first line and then you all repeat together the second line. Here we go. You ready? All right. You awake for this? 
Okay, verse 2. Oh, let Israel say... Now that's pretty good. That's pretty good. I, there's some good full voices there. I wasn't sure if, it, if, we, if we... That was great. I'm, I'm impressed. Good job first hour. <laughs> Oh, let the house of Aaron say. Oh, let those who fear the Lord say. You recognize the first four verses of this song are grace, 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 grace. As if one grace wasn't enough. And what the psalmist is doing is helping us recognize what the Spirit of Christ through the psalmist is saying is it is all about my grace. Come and worship. And say so, and be thrilled about it, and vocal about it. Why? Grace, 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 grace. But what amazes me is there in the upper room, Jesus, the host of the Passover meal, led his apostles in that responsive reading that night. Jesus said, O let Israel say, and the apostles said, His loving kindness is everlasting. Looking at the face of loving kindness. Jesus' boys unwittingly, I'm sure, repeated the very reason for the cross that Jesus was about to be put up on. As they said, His loving kindness, His grace is everlasting. The very act that brought God's grace flowing into this world was just about to happen. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 27 tells us Jesus does not need daily like those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for His own sins and then for the sins of His people. Because this he did once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men as high priests who are weak. But the word of the oath which came after the law appoints a son made perfect forever. His grace is everlasting. And it has to be. It has to be. There's not going to be a single point in all of history where God's grace suddenly has a loophole. Or where suddenly, just for a moment... Our sins become uncovered. His grace is everlasting through Jesus Christ. What a reason to worship. And now we come to the first milestone. I'm going to give you several here in Psalm 118 that are worth noting. For this prophetically speaks in terms of markers of the journey Jesus was about to trod. With the apostles there in the upper room, they sang these verses Oh, let those who fear the Lord say His loving kindness is everlasting. And from that point forward, we begin to march with Jesus, to follow Him footstep by footstep through the night. And the first milestone, gang, is the milestone of Gethsemane. The milestone of Gethsemane. In Hebrew, Gat Shimon. Gat Shimon means olive press. And you know the Mount of Olives is where Gethsemane is, on the lower part of the Mount of Olives. A garden of olive trees. Some of those trees still in existence, we think, today. Or at least close to it. There are trees there that may be 2,000 years old. They're on the Mount of Olives. So the olive press, Gat Shimon, there in the garden, verse 5. From my distress, I called upon the Lord. From my distress. And that was Jesus in the garden. From my distress, I called upon the Lord. Luke 22:44 tells us being in agony. He was praying very fervently. His sweat became like drops of blood falling down upon the ground. The Greek word there, fervently, is ektenesteron. Ektenesteron, which means to stretch out fervently or intensely or earnestly. As Jesus was literally stretched out face down on the ground in the garden in prayer to the Lord... Every ounce of his being aching and distressed and in anguish. So severe was the anguish. You Bible students and students of medicine know this. That the capillaries in Jesus' forehead under severe stress burst. And the blood from the capillaries entered into the sweat glands. and began to drop and drip out of his forehead. Hematidrosis. It is such a severe medical condition that typically the very next thing that happens to a person is death. That milestone should have been a gravestone for Jesus in the garden. As he cried out in distress to God the Father, he was squeezed like an olive in the olive press there at Gethsemane. And in that moment, I wonder, what was it that brought the agony? And what was on Jesus? What was it that he knew? Was it the pain he was about to endure? I mean, if I knew I was headed to the cross, I think I'd be a little distressed. 
Was it the, the betrayal that was all around him? If I knew my friends all were going to turn and run, would I be distressed? I'm sure I would. But in all these things, I think there's one thing that stands out. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of of God in him. Oh, so was it the sin that Jesus was about to endure that he recognized and prayed distress there in Gethsemane? Father, take this from me. I still think it was something even more that distressed Jesus. For in that sin soaked state, Jesus knew he would be out of fellowship, even if for a moment, out of fellowship with the Father. And I think that distressed Jesus more than anything else. And I began this week to think about my own distress. What is it that distresses you? The car breaking down? You know, getting a ticket? Is that distressing for you? Does it distress you to know that things are not going right? Unexpected bills, job pressures? Is that where your distress comes from? Oh, that our distress would be like that of Jesus. The thing that would distress Jesus Christ more than anything else was being out of fellowship with the Father. Oh, that that would be our distress. Then I start to realize, Lord, I'm getting away from you. I need to be with you. I don't want to be separated from you in any way, shape, or form. Oh, that our refuge would be found in God alone. As we read back in Psalm 73, verse 28, As for me, the nearness of God is my good. I've made the Lord God my refuge. From my distress I called upon the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me in a large place. Have you seen Gethsemane? It is a large place. Across that hillside, it covers quite a bit of acreage. At one time, you can even imagine how beautiful that garden was, covered in those olive trees. And there on the night where Jesus was praying in the garden, it sprawls there on the lower half of the Mount of Olives. But that's not the large place that he's talking about here. The Lord answered me and set me in a large place. This is a Hebrew phrase that means security. It means stability. It means confident assurance round about. And note this, after that distress in Gethsemane, after Jesus prayed, he was at perfect peace. You will not see Jesus distressed the rest of the journey to the cross. In fact, John takes great pains to point out that Jesus was in absolute control of everything that happened all the way up to the nails going into his hands. All the way up to the very last moment of his life, his last breath, when Jesus said, it is finished. The the distress is gone. And peace has come. Jesus, his feet are on a wide, a large place. Even through the betrayal and the beatings and the unjust tribunals and the brutality of the cross, from that point forward, from the milestone of Gethsemane, Jesus was in complete control of his emotions, of his spirit, and he was at peace. The Lord is for me. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is for me among those who help me. Therefore, I will look with satisfaction on those who hate me, Can you imagine Jesus eye to eye with Jewish leaders who were venomously angry with him? Hatred, vitriol, looking into him saying, you are not a son of God. You're a blasphemer. I mean, just the anger. And Jesus just looked at him. Complete peace. Complete satisfaction. What about the vicious Roman authorities? Those Romans who were brutalizing him. They're in the praetorium. Or standing before Pilate. And in those situations, Jesus, he's just looking upon the face of his enemies with complete satisfaction, looking on those who hate me, the psalm says. The word satisfaction is not even there. In fact, you may notice in the NASB, and I encourage you from time to time to do this, whenever there's a word that's italicized, it's not in the original language. It was added by the translators just to help the flow of the sentence. Take the words out. Just take them out. Often when I'm reading, now in fact it's funny because when I read a novel that's not in the Bible or I read some other writing and I see something in italics, a lot of times I find myself just dropping it as if it's not necessary. In Scripture it often is not. If you read without that, therefore I will look on those who hate me. So it's not like he had some kind of grim satisfaction. Go ahead, take your best shot. I'm coming back and I'm going to wipe you out. 
That's not the attitude that Jesus said. I will look on those who hate me. The Hebrew word there is literally, I'll look down. I'll look down. But it's not look down condescendingly. It's I'm going to look down. It's a very factual, literal statement. I'm going to look down upon those who hate me. Well, how does that play out? Keep your finger there and turn over to John chapter 18. John 18. Verse 3 of this chapter, John 18. It says, Judas then, having received the Roman cohort... And officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. So Jesus, knowing all the things that were coming upon him, went forth. And he said to them, Whom do you seek? And they answered him, Jesus the Nazarene. And he said to them, I am. Not I am he. I am. And Judas also, who was betraying him, was standing with them. So when he said to them, I am, they drew back and they fell to the ground. And Jesus was looking down at those who hate him. Jesus standing up. And this is a marvelous thing, again, that John points out for us. Jesus is standing there in the garden, and the Roman cohort, which is a huge number, I mean, it could be as many as 600. The Roman cohort and the Jewish leaders and Judas standing there, and Jesus said two words, I am. In the Greek, ego eimi. In the Hebrew, Yahweh. And they knew exactly what he was saying. Even the Romans seemed to figure out, we better back up. As the Jews hit the ground, the Romans hit the ground, everybody's on the ground before him. Because Jesus says, who are you looking for? Jesus the Nazarene, I am. Ego in me. Exodus chapter 3 verse 14 tells us that God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Yahweh has sent me to you. And Jesus claims the name of Yahweh. It's not the only time he's done it, gang. Did it back in John chapter 8 where he said, Before Abraham was born, I am. And here again in the garden, I am. And in that moment, I just love this. Jesus looked down upon those who hated him. Using that same phrase, the impact just drove the soldiers and the leaders to the ground. Literally and spiritually, Jesus looked down upon those who hated him as from a higher place. He would look down upon them from the cross. I will look down on those who hate me. As he was raised up on the cross. From Gethsemane, Jesus went willingly to the next milestone. They brought him before the most powerful man in the province, the, the highest authority this side of Rome. And they took him to a place called Gabbatha. Gabbatha, that's the second milestone. First the milestone of Gethsemane, and then the milestone of Gabbatha, talked about here back in Psalm 118. You can go back there now. The milestone of Gabbatha. Gabbatha, have you heard that word before? It's not often used. John 13 tells us that Pilate brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Gabbatha. It's interesting, the word Gabbatha is used twice in the entire Bible. In John 19, and also back in 2 Kings 16, verse 17, and the situations are similar. 2 Kings 16 and 17 tells us that King Ahaz cut off the borders of the stands, removed the laver from them. He took down the sea from the bronze oxen which were under it and put it on a pavement of stone. And the Hebrew word there for pavement is Gabbatha. What was Ahaz doing? He was desecrating the temple. He was reshaping it after his own image. He, He wanted to do his thing with it. And he was acting in absolute rebellion there on the pavement. It was an act of apostasy on the part of King Ahaz. Fast forward, and here is Pilate sitting on the pavement, Gabbatha. Not the same pavement, but a pavement very close by to where Ahaz had desecrated the temple. Now over at the judgment seat of Pilate, the the pavement, the Gabbatha, a darker apostasy would take place as Pilate there abused his authority and would hand Jesus over to be crucified. Notice verse 8 in Psalm 118. It's better to take refuge in man, in the Lord in the Lord than to trust in man. It's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. And the word princes is literally authorities. 
Jesus standing there before the highest authority in the land at that place in Judea, Pilate. Pilate, the only one who could have let Jesus go. But Jesus doesn't put his trust in Pilate. Jesus doesn't plead with Pilate. They don't know what they're doing. Please, you can save me. I am innocent of all charges. I don't mean any harm to Rome. I'm not doing anything wrong. They're just mad at me. Jesus never does that. He doesn't put his trust in Pilate. He doesn't entrust himself to the authorities. He simply trusts the Lord for his position, for where he is. It's an amazing moment here. Don't put confidence in man or human authority, the psalmist cries out. doesn't mean you don't obey the laws of the land. It means you don't trust the laws of the land. It means you don't trust the authorities to take you where you need to go, to do the right thing. Now, I think it's great our Congress read the Constitution on Thursday. I think that's marvelous, wonderful. It's a good way to start a session. I think it should happen every time. And if it costs the taxpayers a million bucks to do it, fine with me. But I don't put my faith in the Constitution of the United States. That's not where my trust is. It's a great document. But it's not this one. My trust in the Lord, my refuge in Him. John chapter 2, verse 24 tells us Jesus, for His part, was not entrusting Himself to them, for He knew all men. Pilate knew Jesus was innocent. And Pilate's wife, his co-pilot, she knew. And she warned him. But politics and religion were foremost on Pilate's mind rather than the truth. The milestone at Gabbatha, and the reason I stop and mention this is, gang, it shows that even if you're innocent, you cannot trust in man to save you. Only the Lord. So from Gethsemane to Gabbatha to the next milestone, the milestone of Golgotha, verse 10. All nations surrounded me. In the name of the Lord, I will surely cut them off. They surrounded me. Yes, they surrounded me. In the name of the Lord, I will surely cut them off. They surrounded me like bees. They were extinguished as a fire of thorns. In the name of the Lord, I will surely cut them off. I was surrounded, he said, by the nations. And on the cross, Jesus was. At Golgotha, Jesus was surrounded by the nations gang. You think about this, Rome was a polyglot nation. I just had to throw that word in there for anyone who hadn't heard it. Polyglot. It means multiplicity. There were all kinds of different nationalities and cultures represented in the nation, quote-unquote, of Rome. Because Rome conquered countries and then just kind of let them keep their culture as long as they gave complete allegiance to Rome. And so the Romans who were around him were, were of the nation. The Jews, think about this, they were there for Passover. Jews from every nation. So all manner of nationalities were there at the cross, surrounding the cross, looking up as Jesus was hung naked on that cross. I hate to tell you that, but it's true. Something we don't often recognize is that Jesus was most likely completely naked as he hung on the cross. Someone said that when I was a teenager, and I just, I got the image in my head and I hated it for years. I did not want to imagine my Lord hanging naked on the cross at Calvary, and yet... When the crucifixion happened, that's what happened. I mean, what do you think the Roman soldiers were, were playing games for at the foot of the cross? His clothing. So he's up there. He's nailed up there. Why? Lord, why would you allow such shame, such embarrassment? I mean, at least some covering for Jesus there on the cross. Why would it be this way? I, John Corson made a statement about this I heard years ago. And it just blew my mind. And he nailed it. Clothing, he said, depicts culture. But on the cross, Jesus' identification with sinners was cross-cultural. There was nothing to identify Jesus only with one culture. His death was a death for all the nations that surrounded him. Did you hear what DNC chairman Howard Dean last week called the Tea Party movement? Some of you are going to love this. He said it was the last gasp of a generation that fears diversity. Never mind that it's it's been one of the more diverse movements in our national history. But if you want to talk diversity, listen. The crucifixion was the most culturally diverse act in all history. The crucifixion was the one act by which God said to all nations, all the surrounding nations, all people everywhere, I will save you if you will come through this son of mine. 
For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. And the milestone that proved it was Golgotha. The milestone that proved God's love for all people without reference to where they've come from or what they look like. That reference we see, it's Golgotha. Verse 12 reads, they surrounded me like bees. That's an interesting statement because Jesus was enduring stinging mockery. The comments, the statements, the the anger. What must have stung like like bee stings as as the people surrounded and and the vitriol was there. But what extinguishes such rebellion? Verse 12 says they were extinguished as a fire of thorns. Jesus hanging on the cross, thorns on his brow. And you see a lot of talk, a lot of negativity, a lot of attack early on. But I wonder if over the six hours that Jesus was there, if it didn't start to quiet down, if people didn't start to recognize he's not shouting back, he's not angry back. As the blood dripped down his face, His eyes were eyes of compassion. Even the Roman centurion would at one point say, Surely, this was the Son of God. Jesus, the way He handled Himself there on the cross, extinguished the stinging mockery by the fire of thorns. You ever have a needle or something sharp go into your scalp? It doesn't just sting, it burns. It's like fire. It hurts that way. It's something to do with the nerve endings in the skin and around the skull. And so that stinging sensation, that fiery heat. But Jesus took the crown of thorns and extinguished all the bitterness, all the mockery of the people. You know, it's funny. People still have a tendency to criticize Christians. But you don't often hear people criticizing Jesus. Even today, the crown of thorns silences the stinging mockery of people. Best thing you can do when inviting someone to church, is talk to them about Jesus. The best thing you can do is keep the subject on Jesus. Not on you. Not on why you live your life, the way you live your life, but, but on Jesus Christ. Because it's really hard to get angry at someone who's looking at you with love from the cross. Keep it on Jesus. But there's a problem at at Golgotha here. Each verse here that we just read, verses 10 through 12, each one says, I will surely cut them off. (laughs) I'm going to cut them off. I'm going to cut them off. Three times it's said, and all three times I go, yeah, because that would be me on the cross. I'm going to cut you off. I'm going to cut you off too. Three days I'm coming back and I'm cutting you all down. And that's not what Jesus said on the cross. He never said that. That wasn't even the attitude of his heart fine for now, but I'm coming back and I'm going to cut you off later. What did Jesus say on the cross? You remember? Forgive them. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Luke 23, 34. The Hebrew word there for cut, for cut them off, is a very common Hebrew word. It's the word mull. Mull. Except for these three verses, it's translated circumcised. Put it in that context. All the nations surrounded me in the name of the Lord. I will circumcise them. It's not I will cut them off. It's I will circumcise them. That is what the cross is about. It is for the purpose of cutting away sinful flesh that we might be born again to new life in Jesus Christ. I will circumcise. And he's calling for a circumcision of the heart. Paul said in Romans 2.28, He is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. He is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is that which is of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the letter of the law. And His praise is not from men, but from God. All the nations surrounded me. I will circumcise them. Who is Jesus dying for? All the nations. Who is He dying for? All people that any and everyone who would come to Him could be circumcised in the heart. Have the flesh cut away. You know, I want the flesh cut away. Every morning when I stand on the scale, I want the flesh cut away. (laughs) As I grow older and more sedate in my lifestyle, I want the flesh cut away. 
as I look at the life that I live, and Cheryl and I were talking about this, you know, Wednesday night, or maybe it was last Sunday, we discussed a little bit about the fact that the closer you get to the Lord, the more you have to trust Him. It's not less trust is required, it's more trust. He, he draws you into a place where you have to have more faith, and it's a wonderful place to be. But it's a cutting away of the flesh. It's getting rid of the gunk of our lives, which you become more and more aware of. The closer you get to perfect light, the more you see your darkness, and the more you need that circumcision of the heart. And that's what Jesus promised to do there in the milestone of Golgotha. Verse 13, you pushed me violently so that I was falling, or literally so that I fell, but the Lord helped me. The word there that says you pushed or thrust in other translations, as with the centurion's spear, you thrust me. And when Jesus was thrust through by the spear, there at the cross, what was it that came out? Bible students, what came out of Jesus? Blood and water. Blood and water, which symbolize, or you could, we know medically meant his heart burst. That's what caused, ultimately, that his death was a bursting of his heart. And it proved that he was dead. But blood and water are also, as we've talked about, the fluids of birth, not just of death. Because out of his side, new life was birthed. Adam's bride was birthed out of his side. Remember, God took a rib from Adam and created Eve and gave him a bride. Same with Jesus. The bride of Christ was birthed out of his side as he died for us, the church. In his death, gang, Jesus brings new life there at the milestone of Golgotha. Verse 14. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. The sound of joyful shouting and salvation is in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I will not die but live and tell of the works of the Lord. The Lord has disciplined me severely, but He has not given me given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness. I shall enter through them. I shall give thanks to the Lord. Suddenly we come to now the milestone of the gospel of Jesus Christ. From Gethsemane to Gabbatha or Gabbatha to Golgotha to the gospel. If someone asked you this morning... Could you articulate the gospel? Do you know what the gospel message is? Get this down. If you're not sure, get this down. I, I had a conversation with someone this last week who said, you know, I'm, I'm just not sure if I can... If someone said, I want to pray to receive Christ as my Savior, I'm not sure what I would do. And I said, well, what would you do? Tell, I, I just came to you and said, hey, I want to become a Christian. What do I do? What do you say to me? And this gentleman said, I tell you you're a sinner and you need... Jesus' blood and He died on the cross for you. And He rose again so that you could rise to new life. And I went, that's it. It's the Gospel. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 1, I make known to you, brethren, the Gospel which I preached to you, which you also received and in which you stand, by which you were saved if you hold fast the word which I preached to you unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, and that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Listen, gang, the Gospel of Jesus Christ is not a book. It's not Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those Gospels are called Gospels because they talk about Jesus, but the good news is what He did. And it's simple, and we get hung up on it. We don't need to. Christ died for our sins. He was buried. He was raised on the third day. Believe that, and you will be saved. That's the gospel. And it is that simple. And people come along, and they say, wouldn't it be cool to frame this in some kind of a handy-dandy formula so we could remember it and repeat it? No! Don't do that. Don't go there. I don't do that with my wife. What are you talking about, Rick? I don't walk up to people and say, okay, I want to introduce Cheryl to you. Let's see. She's confident, uncompromising, terrific, and exuberant. Cute. I use the cute app, you know, metaphor, or the, the cute acronym, to describe Cheryl. Confident, C. Uncompromising, U. Terrific, T. And exuberant, E. Cute. That's my wife. I just wanted to explain her to you. Now, how stupid would that be? <laughs> 
And you wonder when you're trying to articulate the gospel to people why they look at you like you have two heads. Wait, 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 wait. The formula is, I know there are four spiritual laws. i got three of them. What's the uh, fourth is? I not Gang, listen. The gospel message that we carry into the world is not three steps to a happy life. And it is not four spiritual laws. It's not five points of a theological perspective. It's not even 12 steps to recovery. The gospel is Jesus Christ. Do we understand that? It is a simple thing. He died for our sins and He rose again. And He invites us to die to ourselves and rise with Him. It's that simple. And it doesn't have to be framed in some perfect little... Just tell them what Jesus did for you. That is the gospel. And that's the message that we see here. The sound of joyful shouting. Salvation is in the tents of the righteous. Well, how do you get made righteous? By the blood of Jesus Christ. The gospel message of Jesus. I will not die but live. That's the gospel. That I now have life eternal in Jesus Christ. And I'm going to live forever because of Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. Paul said in Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. It's the gospel. Know the gospel and share the gospel. That is our great commission. Tell them about the gospel of Jesus Christ. So the milestone of the gospel as he, as he proclaims that he's going to live. Open to me the gates of righteousness, verse 19. I shall enter through them. I will give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord, and the righteous will enter through this, or through it. Verse 21, I shall give thanks to you, for you have answered me, and you have become my salvation. Fifth milestone, the milestone of the gate. The milestone of the gate. I originally had a completely different direction in my notes. I was thinking the gate, like Jesus in John 10 talks about, that he is the door of the sheep. Literally the gate. And so the the gate is crossing through Jesus. And I thought, is that what's being talked about here? This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous will enter through it. Could that possibly be an allusion to Jesus himself being the gate and we enter through Jesus? And that's theologically sound. But that's not the gate being talked about in Psalm 118. What is the gate? What are these gates? It's not allegorical or metaphorical. It is literal. And Ezekiel tells us. Turn over, keep your finger there, and go to Ezekiel 43. Ezekiel 43. Just keep going right until you get to Zeke. Ezekiel 43. In verse 1. Listen to this. Ezekiel is having this great vision, an angel leading him to see the future Jerusalem. Way down the line. He led me to the gate. The gate facing toward the east. And behold, the glory of of the God of Israel was coming from the way of the east, and His voice was like the sound of many waters, and the earth shone with His glory. That's Jesus, voice of many waters. And it was like the appearance of the vision which I saw, like the vision which I saw when He came to destroy the city. And the visions were like the vision which I saw by the river Chabar, and I fell on my face. And the glory of the Lord came into the house by way of the gate facing toward the east. And the Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court. And behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house. Go over to to Ezekiel chapter 44. Now listen. What's interesting about the gate, and the gates being talked about in Psalm 118, they're the gates of the temple. They're the gates of the old city, the eastern gate. The gate through which Jesus would return. Now the night that Jesus sang Psalm 118, of course you know He crossed the Kedron Valley and went over there up onto the Mount of Olives and into Gethsemane. And from there was taken, gave himself really to the Roman authorities. He was taken before Pilate at Gabbatha. And then from, from Gabbatha or Gabbatha, he was taken onto Golgotha where he died. Where the gospel happened. Where the whole good news began. And from there, from there, Jesus will come back. He will enter the gate, the eastern gate. His glory will enter by way of the east. In the 16th century, however... Suleiman, the Magnificent, that Ottoman Turk leader, Muslim conqueror of Jerusalem, came in and he conquered and then he rebuilt the city wall all around Jerusalem, burying the eastern gate and constructing a facade where the eastern gate would stand so that there are no hinges. 
There's no way through. It's just a solid wall. It's just if you look today, you can see the eastern gate on the eastern wall there in Jerusalem. But it's not a gate. It's just a solid wall. The actual gate is beneath in the ground. But that gate is there. And Suleiman thought, here's what I'm going to do. We're going to seal it up. We're going to make sure no one can enter through that eastern gate. Because he had heard something of the prophecies of the Jews. We're not going to allow any Messiah to enter this way. And by the way, let's put a cemetery in front of it. Because that will stop him. The problem with Suleiman is he may have read Ezekiel 43. He certainly did not read Ezekiel 44. (laughs) Then he brought me back by the way of the outer gate of the sanctuary, which faces the east, and it was shut. And the Lord said to me, This gate shall be shut. It shall not be opened, nor shall one enter by it, for the Lord God of Israel has entered by it. Therefore, it shall be shut. (laughs) Suleiman was fulfilling prophecy and didn't even know it. As for the prince, he shall sit in it as a prince to eat bread before the Lord. He shall enter by way of the porch of the gate and shall go out by the same way. You can't stop Messiah from going through the gate. And he will do it. But until he comes back, God said, oh yeah, and the gate's going to be shut. And in the 16th century, Suleiman did it. Amazing. The gate. The gate. And here at the gate, we come to the stunning conclusion of the great Hillel. The final milestone, which summarizes the entire rest of this psalm. The milestone, number six, if you're keeping track, the milestone of the glory of Christ Jesus. Verse 22. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Can you imagine Jesus singing that? At the Last Supper, He's singing this song. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And this is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Does it sound familiar to you? Jesus quoted that verse, applying it to himself in Matthew 24. Peter and John quote that verse in Acts chapter 4, verse 11, applying it to Jesus. Paul applies it to Jesus in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20. Peter applies it to Jesus again in 1 Peter 2, verse 7. The chief cornerstone is Jesus. Portrays a picture of Jesus. And by the way, it was massive. In the day of Solomon's temple, 42 feet long, 6 feet wide, 10 feet high, weighing as much as 350 tons. Should be about 700 Volkswagens, I think. The cornerstone. By the way, did you know that one of the places where the stones for the temple were originally quarried was a place called Golgotha? That the cornerstone itself may very well have come out of the quarry of Golgotha. And there's a tradition, you may have heard the old story that the rabbis tell, that at the building of Solomon's temple, a a stone was brought up, a huge stone, a massive stone, and yet they looked at it and said, well, we don't need this, and they set it aside and eventually pushed it off the side, down into a gully, and they began construction and starting to get things ready, and it came time to put on the capstone, the chief cornerstone, and they're like, well, where is it? And someone remembered, hey, We had a stone here, and they went down into the gully and found it, brought it back, and it fit perfectly. The chief cornerstone, rejected by the builders. This was a a Hebrew tradition, something recognized. And it speaks of the greatness and the glory of Jesus Christ, who is the chief cornerstone. Verse 24, (laughs) this is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Now, we had a guy sing this at our wedding. Cheryl and I did. Verse 24, this is the day which the Lord has made. I will rejoice. And I was rejoicing for a completely different reason. I wasn't thinking about the chief cornerstone. That's why we rejoice. He is why we we rejoice. Oh Lord, do save. We, We beseech you. Oh Lord, we beseech you. Do send prosperity. What is that phrase? Oh Lord, do save. Hosanna. Hosanna, we beseech you. Hosanna. Sin, prosperity. Verse 26, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. Now that sounds familiar. And we might say, okay, I think things just got backwards here because we've already been to Golgotha and and we've already been to the cross and and out and and now suddenly this, this is what was said at the triumphal entry, right? 
a week earlier when Jesus rode into the city. Isn't that when it happened? Are we backtracking? No, we're not. Because it's not just a past tense thing. It is a future tense thing. Jesus said the following. As he wept over Jerusalem, he cried in Matthew 23. Behold, your house is being left to you desolate. For I say to you, from now on, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This was said, gang, after his triumphal entry and before his second coming. Because that's what will be said. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord as he comes on the clouds of great glory. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord as Jews will in Jerusalem look up and shout, Hosanna, save us! But when they do, it will come from a place of mourning, more than from a place of joy. Zechariah 12.10 says, They will look on me whom they have pierced. They will mourn for me. As one mourns for an only son, they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. Verse 27, The Lord is God. He has given us life. Bind the festival sacrifice with cords to the altar. And that could speak of the crucifixion. Binding of the sacrifice at the altar. And yet, I'm going to throw a wrench into your theology here. That can allude to the cross. And it may speak of the sacrifice of Jesus. But again, if we're following the flow all the way through Psalm 118, we've already been to the cross. And now we've already come out, we've seen the gospel, and now we're talking about the glory of Christ. And this is at the end of the psalm. Why would it be here, this idea of binding the festival sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar? I think this alludes to something that happens after Jesus' return. Jesus enters gloriously through the eastern gate. He comes in. He goes into the temple courts. And you know what he does there, gang? He begins to function as high priest. What did the high priest do? He offered sacrifices. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Hang on. I thought Jesus' sacrifice was once and for all. So now you're telling me he comes back, goes into the temple, and this whole Jewish system of sacrifice starts over again? That's exactly what I'm telling you. Why? How does that work? Gang, this points to a reinstatement of sacrificial Hebraic worship in the Millennial Kingdom. Let me give you a couple of verses that would back that up. Isaiah 56, verse 7, speaking of the Millennial Kingdom, their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all the peoples. Sacrifices will be acceptable? From the temple? In the kingdom after Jesus' return? Ezekiel 44, verse 11. They shall be ministers in my sanctuary, having oversight at the gates of the house, and ministering in the house. This is speaking of that kingdom. They shall slaughter the burnt offering and the sacrifice for the people, and they shall stand before them to minister to them. In the kingdom. Gang, this is a kind of worship that we with Western mindsets do not understand. We can't even grasp it. With our animal rights activists, we couldn't even do it. You're doing what in that barn? That's sick, that's twisted, that's bizarre. It's Hebrew. It's Jewish. It's serious. Can you imagine, all kidding aside, what worship would be like if there was actually blood sacrifice there? I'm not suggesting we do it at the barn. I'm suggesting it will happen in the Millennial Kingdom. Why? Why would Jesus offer sacrifices if His sacrifice was once and for all? Well, I'll tell you why. Because the sacrifices that used to be for expiation, that is, atonement, will become sacrifices of illustration of what Jesus had done. The Bible tells us there will be children being born in the Millennial Kingdom. Oh, not children to me or children to you. If you're once the church is caught up, once the church is raptured, we're in our glorified bodies. And and that's, that's it. We're good for eternity. And we're part of Jesus' administration as we've talked about quite a bit lately. But there are going to be people in their human form who enter into that kingdom. A third of Israel that's saved among others who perhaps may survive the tribulation, who walk into that kingdom in their human state, children will be born. Children 
who never knew about the sacrifice. Children who know Jesus is the ruler of the world and he's perfect and he's marvelous and he's wonderful and he rules there out of Jerusalem and we see him. But what did he do? Cross? What? How does that work? And every sacrifice that would be offered in the millennial kingdom would not only be very, very Hebrew, but graphically illustrative of all people of what Jesus did. You see, son? You see that lamb that we're offering up here? That reminds us that Jesus, the Lamb of God, was offered at Calvary for our sins. It's not sacrifice that saves. That already happens through Christ. It's sacrifice that portrays what it was that Jesus did. Uh, You can study that through. I encourage you to do that on your own. Think it through. Don't just take my word for it. And don't just disagree with me on purpose. Just go and look. Study it down. Verse 28. You are my God, and I give thanks to you. You are my God, I extol you. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. For His grace is everlasting. These words hung in the air as Jesus went to the milestone of Gethsemane. As Jesus was taken then to Pilate at Gabbatha. As Jesus was on Golgotha. I wonder, was anybody thinking these words? Did anyone say, the stone that the builders rejected? From the gospel to the gate to the glory of Jesus Christ, the grandeur of this psalm is in its prophetic fulfillment. And it's summed up with the very last milestone, with the very last verse, and that is the milestone of grace. Grace, 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 everlasting. This is a forever deal. Don't miss it today. Father, we praise You for Your grace. Father, we praise You that Your grace through Jesus Christ makes us white as snow. Cleanses us completely. Washes the sin, the filth, the stupidity. All the stuff. God, the guilt that we carry washed away. Your grace. We praise You for it. And we give thanks to you because of it as we worship now in Jesus' name. Amen.